Hey everybody, this is your host Jeremy. I want to take a quick second at the beginning of the episode here just to let you know that we have launched a Patreon to support the show. Check us out at patreon.com slash giving the mic. Your contribution helps us cover hosting costs, edit costs, and even some equipment upgrades. Patreon is a way that you can automatically support the show each month with a donation as little as a dollar. Five dollars every month gives you access to regular premium episodes as well as the backer only special cat photo email list. You can actually see the cats of the host that you can hear in the background. Once again, that is at patreon.com slash giving the mic. I thank you, or my co-hosts thank you, and the cats thank you. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm a dork living in Portland, Oregon, who spent too many years listening to podcasts and not doing anything creative. This is my attempt to rectify that, to create and contribute something where I talk to people about their cultural obsessions and try to give some recommendations of my own. Welcome to Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. Derek, you've been kicking around this stuff a lot longer than, you know, a lot of folks have to say. How about, like, we'll start with, like, mistakes, like, baby leftists make. How about that? Um, Be a baby leftist is usually a mistake. But if you're going to make that mistake, there's a bunch you can kind of correct. Yeah, and like, and so, how to avoid them. Um, yeah, I just read an article today that said that uh, Ken Bone, the guy who came up during the... One of the, the second Trump Hillary debate, I think, has said that he's coming out against Trump. So now, first of all, Ken Bone, welcome to the resistance. What advice do you have for Ken Bone? As someone who's just sort of starting out and realizing that there's a problem. Uh, <laughs> um, wow. Oh, so, oh, yeah, let's that's see. Uh, uh, probably join the DSA. Um but don't take it seriously because it's not a party. Um, let's see. Listen to Chapo Trap House, but don't take it seriously because it's not political. Um, read Jacobin Magazine, but don't take it seriously because it's not good. Um, no, uh, let's see. This is a harder topic than you think because there's so many mistakes a baby leftist can make. Right. Um, the, the first one is generally thinking your moral convictions matter at all, <laughs> um, which is a strange thing to say, you know, because I actually am a defender of leftists having moral convictions. But the 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 idea that just because you have them, that other people agree with them, even if they're ostensibly on the left or opposed to Trump or whatever, is kind of a really really bad way to start out um people don't you know be, because the, the the problem with starting out from that point is you you have basically already accused of your opposition of being immoral and we all want to believe that right? right um and one of the first things i think one of the first lessons you have to learn as a as a real true dedicated you know, pink card having lefty is a lot of your enemies are probably more moral than your friends. Um, and that's a hard lesson to learn. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, I, you know, I've had plenty, I've known plenty of great people who are capitalist. That doesn't mean that they're not my enemy. And the, the reason why they're my enemy has nothing to do with moral convictions. It's a structural thing about the way capitalism works. So that's that's one of the first things is is don't assume that your moral convictions actually are what justifies pretty much anything. Um, you should have them for yourself. You should have them to understand what you're doing. Uh, I'm not one of those people who you will tell you some kind of bullshit like Marxism is a science and um, you don't need any moral convictions. That's uh, that's that's in some ways obviously nonsense. But at, at, on another level, though, even something like we all agree on equality. Um, well, I, I think if you actually press people, you discover they either haven't thought about what they really mean by that, or, um, they, they have, and they don't actually mean the same thing that you do. And so the, the idea that it's just based off of moral conviction usually isn't going to give you, get you anywhere. It moves it directly into the realm of sort of philosophy, um, or lifestyleism. So that, and I think that's the first mistake. Now, I expect pushback. Will you please give it? 
<laughs> and you are listening to Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. Hello, everybody. After that nice opening... Uh, <laughs> Uh, once again, uh, we are uh, stuck in our beautiful scenic basement apartment uh, studio apartment studios. Not quite. Yeah. Enough. And studio um, apartment studios. That, that's that's great. Yeah. In uh, in in beautiful, not quite downtown Portland, Oregon, at least where we're lo- locally uh, locally recording. Uh Joining me tonight, uh, you got two guests, one local, one not so local. Nope. I'll just say, I, <laughs> I have a, a friend of the show and repeat guest, Jacob uh, Mercy. Jacob, if you would. Hey, everybody. I think this might be a little bit tense as discussions go because I am, of course, a passionate left libertarian. So we'll try to bridge that divide. So I'll shoot you. <laughs> um... <laughs> that is a violation of the non-aggression pact, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll leave your nap alone. Yeah, I, I, I'm mostly ironic about everything. That's probably my political affiliation more than anything. But I, I, I would consider myself actually a bit of a baby leftist in as much as I have been sympathetic to some of the ideas on the left, but I have always more or less kept a distance from politics until the last couple of years. So yeah, I will be taking notes. I was gonna say, I think. Well, I, will, I, I would. Yeah, I think. Yeah, the way that I came up with the idea in the first place was not so much as let's <laughs> say personal instructional for this, but it's more of like it, it's like it, it seems like um, a whole hell of a lot of people got activated in the last you know shit. Not even like the last night. I don't know, like almost like the last year and change. But um, everybody's coming out of uh, you know coming out of what four decades of bad popular habits oh yeah at least yeah. and and oh my god um oh and oh i should say and oh uh, and joining me on the other end of the line here uh special guest please introduce yourself i am c Derek varn or Derek. um i am a i guess i'm still a blogger um that's actually a contentious thing since i blog maybe twice a year i write book reviews for the hong kong review of books i uh, work for zero books um i am one of the people who decided to publish the infamous angela nagel book that everyone's pissed off about um and who they buy anyway because it's the best-selling book we've ever printed really oh uh, wow. yeah cool and um that. i've read that it. in a in a terrible book that i won't tell you about and Mark Fisher. Those are the three things. Yeah, and remember about the essay I told you? That you, well, you should say that you, you brought up, uh, Jacob, you brought up Vampire Castle? Yeah. Oh, God, he did? <laughs> um, <laughs> just came up in conversation. I assume the other book you're referring to is the one that Zero Books published about superheroes that I actually read. I mean... It, yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah, okay. Capitalist Realism. So yeah, no, that's and, that's like that and the Nagel book are like the only books I've actually read from you guys. So um, uh, it, from the stats, it's that's true for most people, except for except for one other book that I don't like. I'm hesitant to mention because it's anti-Semitic. Uh-oh. Um, and it, um, none of the people who currently work at Zero would have published it. Wow, it's from our time. So uh, it it's the the Edmodzon book. Um, so, um, not familiar with it, but yeah, it's, and it's a good thing you're not, but yeah. un- unfortunately, a lot of right wingers are, and believe it or not, it's probably one of the best selling books we have, which makes me cry because we don't even want it to be on the webpage anymore. Um, but anyway, um, so, uh, and I'm a regular podcast guest. I co I co host Symptomatic Redness, which is a left theory podcast. I have uh, been on Partially Examined Life, uh, From Alpha to Omega, um, basically all the left-wing podcasts you probably never heard of. Um, I didn't get on that Trapo train, which I, you know, apparently am missing out on, since it make more money than the entire in a month than the entire DSAs of operating budget probably. But well, anyway. this is this we're we're basically the farm team for them, so fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. Woo woo. <laughs> um, I- I've insulted too many of them probably to ever be on the show, to be honest. Um, 
not directly and not even purpose, but you know, when you when you are as old and left years as I am, which is funny because I think I think you know uh, many of the people. Who, in fact, I know some of the people in this podcast are older than me, but I've been involved in the left for oh god, almost twenty years, and um, since I was like sixteen years old, I took I took a ten year break um, in my mid twenties and uh, went through a brief period of reading the American Conservative and like thinking Pat Buchanan may not be totally crazy, and then I woke up. Um, so you know, it's just a, a weird fever dream that I had. And um, went back, and I've been around since, you know, I think 2009, 2010. Um, and so I'm in that odd demographic that's old enough to have teenage kids and still talks to leftists all the time, which is a very weird demographic to be on. I wonder if, I wonder, I wonder if, they, I wonder if there's a uh, what, um, what horrible marketing demo that would, that would have you fall into. It's Ooh, not quite God, not, middle not, age. Yeah, not no, not, <laughs> not quite. Huh? Yeah, not quite millennial, but yeah. Well, I, I think I technically am a millennial. I was told recently that I was, and I was really offended about it. Um, but they moved the date back to 1980. Bastards. Yeah, they did. Wasn't it? What well, was it before? It was because uh, I was I was always the uh, I'm like the la- I was the last year of of, G- of Gen X, so. What what is that? Nineteen seventy six, I think. Oh uh, yeah. At least that was well, the. Yeah, I think it's Dan Ninen's birthday. Yeah. So originally, um, Gen X was seventy six, and it got moved up to eighty two, and then it got moved back down. Right. It's yeah. Whichever marketing firm is targeting or or whoever uh, whoever angry uh, op ed writer at the at the New York Times wants to target this time. Right. So you know. It, it, I'm assuming that I'll wake up one day and find out that I'm in Z somehow, but and the gen, the, the millennials are just not a thing. Would they you just weren't? Would you say that there are things that you have noticed that are particularly different from your own beginnings as a leftist and people who are coming into it fresh now? You know, I I would say no, actually. But I, what I would say is when I came back into it was a different – people were coming into it for a different reason, and that maybe is a good thing to talk about. Because when – the resurgence of, like, the Marxist left is totally tied to the um, housing crisis. And the resurgence of sort of the anti-Trump left, very much like the anti-Bush left before it, is actually at the end of a business cycle that's now, you know, turning back positive. So – if you look at the Great Recession as sort of an extreme business cycle, which it was, um, and then you see Trump coming in on the wave of a positive business cycle, it's very similar to the way voting trends were going in the late 90s, early aughts that got Bush into the office. I mean, even the, the, even the fact that um, Trump didn't win the popular vote and that it was a particularly low vote count um, is very similar. So that reminds me of the end of my teenage years. Um, things that are different, uh, the vocabulary is entirely different. In fact, it changes so fast I can't keep up, um, which I have suspected is a perverse form of cultural capital that leftists don't even realize they're engaging in. Um, Probably, and I don't, yeah, more than likely, I don't think social media ain't exactly helping that. Mm-mm. And, uh, you know, like, when I, like, I left, I um I left the United States and like I think I'd seen cishite used once, and you know and um, the way we talked about trans issues was completely different and this was all in two thousand nine two thousand ten mm-hmm. and um, when I come back like I don't know I feel like we've refought the seventies again and we had a whole new vocabulary. Um, so for, for the real listeners who don't know me, I've been out of the United States for eight years. Um, so. What led you to uh, what? What led you to do that? Just an opportunity to teach elsewhere, or just want to get that? Yeah. Want to get out? I'm a mercenary teacher. Um, uh, you know, actually, during the Great Recession, I was effectively um, told that the next round of um, layoffs, I was going to be laid off as a teacher, and I was like, you know what? I have 40 students in my classroom. I teach seven classes a day, and that's only a slight exaggeration. And um, my my marriage was ending and all this stuff, so I was just like, "Fuck it, I quit." <laughs> and wow. 
a friend of mine contacted me and was like, "Hey, you know, you have a you have a terminal degree. Um, why don't you know quit slumming it as a public school teacher, being some naive liberal waif, and come out and make some real money doing um, teaching at a university? It wasn't really that great of money, but comparatively, yeah. And um, and you know, you can have an academic career again if you want it. And so, um." I interviewed, uh, put my CV out. I did that whole committee thing, uh, and then I got told, "Hey, you're coming to Korea in a month," and so I went to Korea, and then I traveled abroad for eight years. I lived in northern Mexico and in North Africa, specifically Cairo, until about three months ago. Not bad. Well, he's one of the, one of the more traveled one of our one of the more traveled of our guests. But. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it's it's been interesting because like I the the last time I was in the United States a lot before moving back was actually occupied because my university job kept on having me go to conferences. So I would actually go to these academic conferences and I pop I was in these cities, so I could pop in and like visit Occupy Oakland and Occupy San Francisco and uh, Occupy New York right before right after the camps shut down. But I was seeing it and comparing it to say Occupy Yoido and Seoul mm-hmm. and. Um, uh, Occupy, um, Occupy Taipei, um, and they they all dissipated pretty spectacularly, but in different ways. So Occupy Yoido became kind of so basically North Korea endorsed it and it shut it down, <clears throat> um, and it turned into a a, a right wing nationalist, um, well right and left together nationalist anti globalization. Um, movement. Interesting. Um, and uh, very nationalist, very, very, um, you know, like some of those protests I remember, and I was in Busan, and uh, w- one of these anti globalization protests that would come out of, originally out of Occupy Yo- Yoido, was also like protesting the World Council of Churches for being too liberal and something else. You know, I was like, wow. That's different. This is not what I signed up for. Um, but um so that was that and then now Trump's happened and um you know I'm of the opinion that the Democrats seem to to want Trump to run re election with a twenty two percent approval rate. So and I think they're dead set on making it happen. Um so I'm very interested in what the left is gonna say and do about that. And so far, hashtag resistance doesn't seem to be able to decide if it opposes or supports the Democrats, and this is up to and including most of the DSA. Hmm. And as of as and my second piece of advice to baby leftists in all seriousness is figure out where you stand on that. Um I'm not saying you have to like have a clear like I'm not saying you I'm not telling everybody, oh, you can't work with Democrats, but you have to be clear about what, when and why. Um, and if you're muddle headed about it, you're going to be taken advantage of. What would that look like? I should say, what would it look like to, um, what to like throw down concrete definitions or concrete boundaries? Um, Or for example, maybe. Well, figure out like when when are you not going to give money to an to an NGO that's going to help fund Democrats? Like, what's that line going to look like for you? You have to know that. Um, so for example. The, the the AFL-CIO, which I could rant on and on and on about for other reasons, but they give Democrats money even when Democrats are shutting them down. Yeah, they, you know, others have noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that if if you're going to support an organization like that, and I, you know, I'm not telling people not to join a union, but join as many as you can. Uh, <laughs> But let's be honest for a second. If that's what you're doing, you're you're actually you're not really supporting a union. You're supporting a, a lobbying organization. Yeah. And so far, that lobbying organization isn't very effective, um, because Democrats will still pass you know right to work laws, still break up teachers unions. Um, they won't pass worker legislation when they have a chance to, et cetera, and so forth. Oh, yeah. um, and Babies, baby, uh, baby leftists need to know this history because they, you know, like they often forget. They, they, I, I love when I talk to baby leftists and they're telling me about how we should side with Democrats and forget that like 2008 to 2010 happened. So, yeah, well, there's a lot of talk about ha- having to be pragmatic and 
having to be realistic and yet at the same time when you look at the results they're pretty terrible consistently with oh yeah i think pragmatism is a, a good way to say stockholm syndrome yeah well and i think one of the things that i see a lot coming from some more classically liberal types is that they seem to have a lot of trouble picking their battles and it's easy to go ahead and speak out against trump but there's a lot of other things where it's almost like they they they're struggling with how to deal with conflict internal conflict or conflict with anybody else both both yeah. <laughs> um let's uh, let's like think about this uh, so one of the things i've noticed and I, it, it's e it's so easy to pick on but it needs to be like really understood someone disagreeing with you is not the same thing as someone gaslighting you for example right yeah that's a that's a that's a psychological tactic that makes sense if you don't understand how deliberation works and you're reaching for a toolkit without really respecting what the tool is for. Um and that's that's a baby mistake. I mean like to be fair like everybody does that when they when they're growing up and maturing into some kind of anything probably. Yeah, um Hell, I think what a year or two ago, I think it was of all things, it was like it was the cracked podcast and Jack Pargin talking about how, um, like one, um, the, the you know, somebody will, you know, somebody online will discover this brand new concept. It turns out it's like this shiny new tool that they then present, like, oh wow, this is awesome. And it's, it's kind of, um, and kind of run around and misuse it repeatedly. Like, hey, have you heard about this thing called plot holes? Check this out. Here's, you know, I just wrote, I just wrote, you know, a thousand words on this post about, you know, like the 20 best plot holes of the, of the, um, uh, you know, from like this summer's movies alone. Yeah. Oh, God. I mean, like, I feel like everybody discovered um, Peggy McClintock's Invisible Knapsack in 2009, even though I've been around for 20 years. Um, and which, you know, I actually, to defend that essay a little bit, it gets a lot of crap now. And Blibber's Chalk is actually going out of vogue after, after a long time. But one of the issues with um, that is that metaphor, and it's a metaphor, it's pretty good for explaining how like structural co cultural capital work when you pair it with economic capital together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, it works as an illustration or a metaphor for that in a way that like people can get right. But that term became used to the point that it was used to explain the like the cause of the thing it was a metaphor for. So why is there structural racism? Because people have privilege. Well, you're no, that's that actually you're saying what if you unpack what privilege is you're saying there's structural racism because there's structural racism it's tautological yeah and you you, you sound like you're you're actually making a, a difference and you're not like you, you sound like you understand or you're giving some profound meaning but actually you're confusing a description for something as a cause for something and that has really hurt um discourse about a lot of things um and Including class, I mean that vampire castle essay. I actually critiqued it. I, I wrote a critique of it. Um, I I and two other of my co-editor friends um, at the North Star, you know, approached Mark Fisher for it. He did a favor to a friend of mine um, and wrote it for us. And oh my god, um, the the fallout from that essay when we published it. Uh, and it's weird because there's people now who defend it who like attacked it viciously. Um, Sam Chris uh, wrote, and it's still on the website if you want to find it, a, a scathing attack on Fisher. Um, and uh, and has recanted it both privately and publicly why since do you, then. Uh, why do you think the uh, what do you think brought about the uh, the change in a lot of people who um, who kind of flipped or, you know flipped around from uh, you know from offense to defense on it? Uh, I think. <sighs> Honestly, um, cynically speaking, I think the the there's a turn to you know distance themselves from liberals like Hillary Clinton, who started picking up all the language of of leftism and co-opting it. Mm. So there's a move by by people in the DSA and Chapo to be more edgy by adopting what was a, what was originally kind of a mixture of liberal and, and fisher wasn't a fisher wasn't even a marxist so like we need to put that out there too um 
a, a mixture of kind of liberal theoretical, like Deleuzian kind of semi-socialist, and then left communist critiques that overlapped, um, and they were they were seen as very destructive, um, and then a lot of people changed their tune when they started seeing mainstream levels pick up a lot of the language of the, you know, identitarian, the left identitarian, Mm -hmm. um, sense. And I think you saw a reaction against that currently, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that some people aren't running too far the other direction. Um, actually, even though, you know, I'm one of those people who quote unquote distrust ID politics, quote unquote, but I, I do worry that we're replacing one identity politics that's kind of superficial with another identity politics is kind of superficial because workerism is not the same thing as class analysis. So I guess that would be my third warning to a baby leftist. Like there's nothing inherently good or bad about being a proletarian in some kind of moral sense. Um, and there's nothing that's going to give you, I mean, I guess unless you're a standpoint, like a hard line standpoint epistemologist, um, there's nothing that's going to give you like some kind of understanding of the world innately just because um, someone is oppressed. Like, they have that understanding of their oppression as a qualia, but it doesn't give you any more insight to the structure of it than, I don't know, anything, really. Um, so sort of like just because um, just because you got hit by a truck crossing the street doesn't know you necessarily now know how to redesign crosswalks? Exactly. You, you just know it hurts to get hit by a truck. So... <laughs> It's the same thing, and that, and a lot of a lot of standpoint arguments conflate to two things. Like, oh, I know it gets hit by a truck, therefore I know the structure of a truck. Nothing worded that way. One of the things that I've noticed is popping up a lot is not necessarily the co-opting of a lot of these ideas, but in some cases the corruption, and I think. One of the reasons why the Vampire's Castle essay got flack is actually because it was in some ways a very similar to some of the critiques that have come from the right. And I, 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 I've noticed that there's a lot of uh, times in the hashtag discourse when you see people who are deliberately uh, or maliciously misusing things or corrupting things like concepts like uh, you know, in in the literary world, there's a lot of complaint about the author is dead when people just don't actually understand what that means. And there's a lot of things like, you know, uh, anti-feminists will excitedly leap on the quote, you know, all sex is rape, even though that's a, you know, very minority viewpoint and has a very complex meaning embedded in it. And I mean, even you said at the start of this podcast, your first rule, moral convictions don't matter I can see being put on a billboard somewhere to point out how, you know, bankrupt the left is. Oh like, yeah, well I mean how, how do you how do you how do you A lot of right wingers love what I say. I yeah. mean, that that sometimes keeps me up at night, honestly. I mean, so mm. go ahead. Well, so how do you how do you combat that cynical manipulation and that shell game of m- moving meaning around? You shoot them. No, um, no. Uh, I can't. My uh, all my my rifles are in my dad's gun uh, gun safe out in ex urban Tennessee. So I appreciate your support of our constitutional liberties. Um, <laughs> uh, no, um, you know, actually, I don't know that you can actually fight it because here's the thing, um, conservative. You know, I, I have talked about this. To some degree before, conservatives and, and um, reactionary is a word that's so hard to define that I don't like using it anymore. It just means people I don't like. But oh, I use, we use the word like, hipster. Mm-hmm. Huh? I said, no, we use the word hipster for that. But anyway, go on. Sorry. Yes. It, well, that too. Reactionary hipster, they're really kind of the same thing. Um, but I think in some ways you have to remember the right and conservative aren't necessarily – the same movement in a lot of ways. Um, like the conservatives are on the right, but the right as a separate sort of entity can have things that are not conservative at all on it. Um, and what they are very, very good at historically speaking. And, and, you know, as, as much as people don't like the Nagel thesis and I disagree with parts of it too, but they are very good at it, not just co-opting, but actually coming from the left. Um, 
And this is historically true. I mean, you can, you know, you, you can meet any idiot libertarian. He'll talk to you about how the Nazis, uh, you know, were are, are socialist. But then, like, the slightly smarter ones who actually read General Goldberg's stupid book will then realize that, oh, like, Mussolini really was a socialist. Yeah. And they co-opted a lot of socialist language. Um, there's a, There was a, a movement of, you know, Alexander Dugan in the fourth political position one of the things they used to do is infiltrate like anti-imperialist um facebook groups and try to recruit them you know recruit people who were um hardline communists because they spoke the same language and even sometimes would use the same sort of beliefs about like proletarian nations and stuff and both and they believed it too hmm. how long ago, um, how long ago was that it's probably well it's probably shit it's probably still happening but it's still happening actually but it started around 2011 okay Liberals realized that Alexander Dugan was a thing when Trump won because Bannon tweeted something once, I guess. And this was funny to me because I'm like, I've known about him since the, literally since the 90s. Like, um, and I'm not because I'm that old, but just because I used to be a part of a, a punk subculture that had racist and anti racist uh, and occultist and stuff involved with it. And so these weird um, national Bolshevik people were, were on the, on the periphery of that, um, what, even in the late nineties. So that's not new at all. What city? Know. What city? Atlanta. Okay. Um, yeah. Late nineties. I was in, um, a, yeah, late nineties. I bounced between, uh, Ann Arbor, a lot of, lived in Ann Arbor, a lot of Ann Arbor, Detroit music scene for me, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, even though like in your, in your Pacific Northwest, like Troy, uh, Southgate, um, who is, you know, an ex being, uh, ex British national party person and a, uh, a fascist, if there ever was one, you know, he was writing for post for post left Green Anarchy magazine. You know, um, so this isn't new. Yeah. Um, at all, and people often don't do due diligence. Um, and it's, I mean, it was funny, actually, hilariously funny, because one day, like all my lefty friends are like, uh, two years ago, like everybody loved Russia Today, and you know, and all these lefties were co constantly, you. Know, quoting stuff that I, knew, that I knew was kind of Kremlin agitprop in many ways. Not always bad news either. But, um, and then, you know, the election scandal happens and then people are like, oh my God, Putin's right wing. And I'm like, where have you been? Yeah, well, the like, <laughs> best disinformation is the truth, so. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you just don't, you didn't realize that like, oh, they put lefties on, but they also gave Richard Spencer airtime before it was cool and liberals were trying to figure out why Nazis were scary. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It's, well, that's the thing. Is like RT has. I mean, shit. That's the um, um, radio host out of Portland forever. Like Tom Hartman had his like TV show on there, and Sylvex still does. And that's where it's where Ed Schultz wound up after leaving MSNBC. Mm-hmm. I mean, and then they also had you know, um, some far rightists in there. Then this is not you in left circles. Um. Alexander Cockburn was famous for doing this sort of thing. Yeah. Like talking about how nasty U.S. nationalism was and then like praising Marine Le Pen. Um, and then, you know, I remember when Jacobin wrote a, a praise to the man. I just could I like I was I was like livid. I was, you know, I was like, seriously, seriously. You know, you're the kind of people that give me crap because I, I had a I had a conservative like moment in a few t in my in my 20s and yet you're forgiving someone who put um israel shamir on a platform if, and 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 you know people who are uh, who if not paleo conservative are not fascist um and yet that's totally okay because you know at the time counterpunch was probably the most popular left-wing website and the internet's actually still way more popular than people realize i remember um, i remember so it's, it, it was it was kind of shocking. I, I, one of the things I think people don't know is a lot of the sites that you think are reputable don't get as much traffic as the sites you don't. Um, so like one of the shocking things for me is when I looked at the Alexa, like the the numbers for like the Daily Stormer versus um, like AlternativeRight.com or Radix, you know, which is you know Richard Spencer's group. The Daily Stormer had way more hits. 
but you don't know like why it does are, are like hipsters like going there to mock about how racist it is or has it actually got more people involved you don't really know yeah um you can't really do yeah you can't uh you can't divine ironic uh intention from just a from a web from a, a website click right I, I guess maybe another warning to baby leftism is watch your ironic intention and watch your denouncing of things because you're often spreading the things you're denouncing more than if you've not said anything um Richard Spencer, for example, is a perfect example of this. this was, he was an obscure editor of um, the American Conservative in the mid-aughts. Um, I actually met him once, weirdly. Um, Small world. Did you punch him? Yeah. Yeah, did you no, punch well, him? No, he wasn't a Nazi yet. I mean, he was, oh. but we didn't know that. And, okay. Um, <laughs> no, I did not punch him. I, this was before the Richard Spencer punching craze. So you, uh, so you uh, wouldn't punch baby Richard Spencer? Yeah, would you could travel? Would you travel? <laughs> yeah, that's the question. Would you travel back in time to if you could and punch, uh, baby Richard Spencer? May, uh, I sure, I guess. Hell yeah! You know, I think Nazi punching is all fun and games until someone actually gets an AK forty seven. Yeah. Um, but you know, to be to be completely frank with you, the, the one thing about Richard Spencer was, it was kind of shocking is how nebbishy liberal he was. For conservative, like, um, I mean, even using a, a a Jewish phrase like "nevish" is kind of deliberate poking at him. But um, <laughs> no, no, that, no, that's the thing. It's like, dude, co- yeah, dude, actually, really comes off as like, yeah, just kind of like a what nebish, like he's a putz. Yeah, schmuck. Yeah, yeah, and um, he studied Ordarno under the father of the alt right, who's a Jew. Yeah. So you know, I mean, seriously. That you can't even make this up. So, you know, um, and I would have never thought anyone would have cared when I was seeing the alternative right come on. Like it was just, it was like, like it was like meeting people from like World Net, you know, World News Daily, or even I don't know, like um, Townhall dot com. Yeah, or it was it was like two steps up from like Stormfront dot com, but like not much. And you're just like, who's going to give this guy any legitimacy? You know, he, he left, he actually left uh, groups that had a lot more legitimacy because they thought he was too radical. And, um, well, you know who did? We did. <laughs> you know, um, the left is actually probably the biggest gift to him in some ways. And I don't just, mean, I'm not even talking about the Nazi punching t- days. I actually don't so much care about that. I'm talking about before that. Because we kept on making this group out. I mean, National Policy Institute was tiny. Mm. Um, but it was held. It was kind of like the 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 most tangible, most obvious example of something. So it was like the right. immediate go to for everybody, and thus um, got you know got the spotlight that high that way. Yeah, and that's we spread it by accident. We have to be very careful with that. Um, I quit doing that for a long time. I used to denounce what I would think would be stupid lefty ideas, and then I would realize that, like, no, I was spreading them too by even denouncing them. Let's we'll see. Um, how, how do you? Um, is there? Let's see. Is there? Is there a middle ground? But is, is there a way to you know contest or combat that without also uh, with you know without also you know somehow uh, rebroadcasting it or just kind of like you know having it echo off you. Of, well, of... one thing I do now is I don't, and if if it's something that I just think there's an error and I really want to have a dialogue, I link, but I don't link back to the original sources a lot of the time. Mm. Um, and I know that seems like you know vague posting in a lot of ways, but even when I write about a professional, I just I don't want um, to give direct links to this. I want to make it just a step harder for someone to access these ideas. Um, I'll quote them, I'll cite them, but I won't link them. Um, and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not sure that that's really going to like, it's not going to change getting Richard Spencer on the news, um, and watching all my normie friends freak out about it because of things that said on CNN. But I think often we, we just don't know how much we're spreading a lot of the stuff. Another example that would be Sargon of Akkad. I mean, like so many attacks of Sargon of Akkad have spread Sargon of Akkad. And Conversely, I also think no platforming doesn't really work for the same reason. Because when you no platform someone, you actually tend to draw attention to them. It's it's it. I know, like we could we could talk about something you know like the Streisand effect. I was gonna say really, that sounds like Streisand effect, doesn't? Yeah. 
Yeah, where, it's um, effect. Yeah, where uh, yeah, where you know trying to cover, you know, trying to block attention to it winds up, you know, winds up exacerbating the attention attention paid it even more. Well, like, who cared about Charles Murray until people started protesting him again? I mean, like people cared when the when the bell curve came out, but he's released like ten books since then, and no one said a damn thing. Well, and I think there there needs to be a distinction made between an actual detailed critique. I remember uh, Stephen Jay Gould wrote a quite good look at the at the bell curve, and mm -hmm. I remember that uh, you know there have been instances where I have seen basically people take a step back after getting their asses handed to them in in a debate or something. But at the same time, you've got people like you know uh milo yiannopoulos who was basically exposed as a pedophilia enthusiast although not actually practicing by most accounts and he basically just took a couple months sabbatical and now he's back getting exposed as a as a nazi enthusiast so it seems like the denunciations don't even work anymore no, and also the denunciations matter from who they're coming from. So who co like who could call him a pedophile enthusiast? It wasn't a leftist. And I, um, yeah, Milo got shut down because it was the, you know it was the it was the, the right wing fuckheads were the ones who shut Milo down yeah, the first time. Wasn't... It was neoconservatives. It was it was the Daily Caller. It was Glenn Beck's people. Yeah, I mean like what we did didn't matter. We could out that he was trying to like you know um, basically dox. Uh, immigrants and, and trans people apparently I mean that that was what we said to justify the price and all we did was actually increase his book sales when the right wing people attacked him his book his book contract got canceled overnight um, and then that didn't even stick right because mm -hmm. um, it's another thing and there's reasons why leftists can't do it I mean um, have you read most of the left writing about a lot of the left wing writing about um, about age of consent laws because a lot of leftists oppose them too at least did this seems to have changed recently but in the 70s 80s and 90s it was a standard position yeah i do remember that i remember so, um i re i remember the what was what was uh similar it was one of the things that popped up right after bowie died yeah because oh, of yeah. because of you know his his 70s history Something I think you might be able to answer that that's been ping ponging around my head for like a while now is I'm wondering at what what point did like moralism and moralizing become like the dominant I don't know like the dominant political axis for like anybody who any non conservative to even you know that that's how they express themselves it became the the only way of like the the only it's like the only thing anybody could say or only thing that anybody could do was just say you know you're bad because of this and everything had to be seen through a filter or could only be interpreted as a filter as to good bad you know from an internal viewpoint. You understand? Yeah. You get that? Okay. Yeah, I got it. So, Ill-formed question on my side. Yeah, I mean, even even with Milo, you know, he when he was attacked for being a pedo enthusiast and a nazi i don't think the argument was that the views were abhorrent i think the idea was that he was a bad person and should be no platform because of that it was a it was it was moralizing in which i you know in this case in support of but it wasn't actually any sort of you know intellectual critique right well i mean i think okay there's three things one this comes into play when the left builds and fails so if you look at 1968 you see this happening in two yeah, late 60s um, early 70s yeah late 60s or 70s it goes away during the 80s because they try it with reagan and it doesn't work it doesn't stick um like no one it's just normies don't care mm -hmm. all right because they don't share that framework um in the 90s it kind of comes back but kind of doesn't too because um the idea of empowering the moral majority after 1990, let's see, six is seen as too dangerous, right? Um, particularly, I mean, after 92, really. Um, so definitely after 96. Mm. So you don't want to do that either. Um, and then it comes back in the, in the late aughts and kind of goes away because we basically you have an inter-left fight about like liberals versus the left, which – does kind of clarify some things um and then it comes back again and, and i think this is a way for people who are in essentially microcultures to differentiate themselves and it's actually not that uh, particularly political so 
And I'm not saying that, again, that moral denouncements don't ever have a place. But if you start from the framework that if people don't accept your framework, they're immoral, you you have automatically, from just both a psychological and rhetorical point of view, you can't even make your moral case. Yeah. Because you have started from this framework. The case itself is so sacrosanct that to make that would be a problem. Um, and that comes back up. All the time, you know. I, I sometimes think it's when the left moves too far away from economics. Um, and right now, it's hard for us to attack on economics because the economy is not that bad. I mean, it's not good, but it's not what it was in, in 1990. Uh, it's not what it was in 1999. But it's also actually it's probably better than it was in 1999. But it's it's also not what it was in 2007. So so we don't have a good grounds on which to combat this because the immediate numbers are not in our favor in that regard. But again, if we if we understood like bigger Marxist theory about say profit cycles or just fucking basic economics actually, hmm. um, this would you know because even bourgeois economics gets this. This would be perfectly clear about like how this is happening and how. How it's you know you see a, a downward trend in wages and and all this other stuff. Um, we don't want to deal with it because that's more difficult. It's not as sexy and it doesn't it doesn't place you in the media very well. And I guess maybe one uh, uh, another point that I you know and this is an ironic podcast to talk about it because you guys are all in media too. But everybody on no, the no, left right no. now seems to believe that media really matters. And I, you know, and if you change the media, you can change public perception, I guess, because real and grace happened or something. I'm working on but, a comic book that's going to change everything. Right, exactly. I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm an engineer who, I'm a, who just does uh, uh, iPhone cat photography and a podcast on the side, so. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and as an artist myself, I would love to believe that, but I actually think the opposite is true. Culture drives media more than the other way around. Um so starting from a point of view of media criticism is always going to dip in the moral criticism because they're essentially both aesthetic. Yeah, that's, I think, that, yeah, because like one of the things that I did notice, and especially, I mean, it's, yeah, it, uh, again, like a, a recurrent trend, especially last year, especially since after the election last year, was the, um, the, as you mentioned that, you know, how the focus on the, like the moral aspect wasn't, you know, was like, you know, was anything but politically useful. It was kind of a thing of the sense that I got, you know, that I got from a lot of people pushing back that we can't talk, you know, we, if we, you know, all of those people who didn't vote necessarily the right way, they were all inherently bad people. And because of that, we couldn't talk or uh, we couldn't talk to or try to convince or even aim at because somehow this would, what, sp just by, you know, I don't know, interacting with it would somehow like spread the moral taint. And... Yeah, and it and it's interesting to think about because, for example, um, if you if you if you take the uh, low end estimate of how many people voted in the last election, you get something like fifty four percent of possible voters voted, and forty um, forty percent of all U.S. voters voted. Yeah, it's something. Yeah, it's, like, it's like yeah, it's it was like sub fifty, wasn't it, or barely? Yeah, or, yeah. It's hard. It's actually hard to like to like disaggregate that one of the I, I was quoting a number at one point then I realized that I actually didn't know the number because some of those numbers include people who are under 18 in them and some don't um which is weird hmm. but it's it, what you discover is like even at the best where you have majority political participation you're only you're only breaching it at about four or five percent a majority which means that these people are getting elected off of like 24 versus 22 percent um in uh, you know a, a two-party system without third parties breaking it up, and so if you want to get mad at people, get I guess you can get mad at people who don't vote. Um, but what good is that going to do you? Because the re like you you have to address why they're not voting, and yeah. it's not it's not just because they're bad people. It's because a lot of people, particularly working class people, if you look at the numbers, people who make under um, seventy thousand dollars a year. And I can I actually don't even define working class that way. I define it the Marxist way, which isn't by income, it's by what you do. But um, even if you look at that, it's still like most people who are on the lower end of the working class don't vote. Period for anybody, whether they're uh, black, white, or whatever. Like yeah, I, I mean I think it. I see a lot of people, particularly here in Portland, who uh, particularly among people who are very 
well off and comfortable complaining very loudly about people who don't vote and most frequently accusing them of being lazy when I see it as when you actually talk to some people who don't vote it's a it's something that they do out of a very strong conviction that there's no point yeah Um, it's a a principal position like you may not agree with it but well, yeah, and that was well. That was the thing that always struck me is that at some point, getting back to epistemological issues, you have um, a lot of like professional media types, and even like you know people who are way too obsessed with politics. The the only way it's I mean it's almost like a sampling error. Like they can't conceive uh, like you you um like they can't conceive of like a null hypothesis. Like the only people the only way they can think of how to figure out what happened is only to the like the segment of population that that actively voted the wrong way but it and so they have to go you know we're, we went out and talked to trump voters but it's never the it's like they can't conceive of of what well, i don't know, like logically inverting it of like finding the people who didn't vote at all it's like the the um is like you know as people you know when all those pie charts came out of the numbers of like you know that that just showed how you know here's how many people didn't vote at all and here's how many people couldn't vote. It, be- it became a thing where like only people who ex- you know had the the expressed intention of voting the other way were the only ones that anybody uh, any like media person could talk to, rather than without you know without asking well, you know why why didn't you or why couldn't you? Right. Well, the thing is, baby baby leftists are driven by the media like everybody else is. Right. I mean, like I am too. I'm you know, like you know. This is not this is not me saying oh you can't be driven by the media because you're gonna be if you say that you're lying, but at, at another at another point you also realize you have to realize that you drive the media the, what you do live in a capitalist society that really does want to to comfort your biases even ones you're not aware of, um, and so when you start with these media narratives you're gonna ampl- there's gonna be an amplification effect. And that amplification effect tends to, uh, tends to, like I said, cast itself in aesthetic terms and then moral terms. Like you know, mm-hmm. these people are bad because they, they do these bad things. And, and instead of asking, like you know, why would this happen? Um, and another thing that you have is a lot of left wing thinking. And you know, I say this as a Marxist who basically believes capitalism is ruining everything. But a lot of left wing think as thinking uses its enemies, like. Um, the patriarchy, our structural racism, and in ways that are so vague that it's it's almost conspiratorial, but not even in a conspiracy theory like crazy way, but in like a demi urge that rules the world and has falsely created it sort of way. Like we like, can't, this can't you happen because of fighting. okay, yeah this this thing this this can't we this can't happen this particularly good thing can't happen or this bad thing happened due to like this. Uh, slightly abstract concept kind there, of a thing. There was a article in the New York Times the other day that was actually criticizing uh, Tanahisi Coates because of that. Yeah, and I thought it was really good. I mean, I, I've been criticizing Tanahisi for about two years off of the same thing because he seems to make whiteness more and more powerful, and also he seems to think the entire political spectrum is decided by a group of right elites, um, and that if he shames one side into into being better. Than the other, because he ta- he actually talks about this in one of his essays that like white working class white people don't vote so like we're like to blame it on working class whites is stupid because it's not you know he but he takes the opposite lesson from it from me um, so he's like well we have to shame these white elites because you know the only reason Hillary Clinton was better than Bernie and he goes off to attack Bernie but he says because she had a more problematic racist past that we could get her on that was essentially his argument. I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did not. I think I only. I don't think I only re- read the responses to the uh, to the, New York, the the Times bit recently, and I don't remember. Um, I think yeah, that was. I didn't actually read the original one, but it was kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the interesting things about why some people were staying home uh, in 2016 is because uh, Cambridge Analytica, the data team that Trump hired, was specifically targeting those people to try to get them to stay home. I mean, that's oh, yeah. what they were spending money on with, with Facebook. Well, and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think that, well, but with that, wasn't the, I'm trying to remember, because I remember, the, yeah, when the coverage of that happening, but it was also that 
was that, was that was that Bannon's group or was just something that he was just like vaguely affiliated with? Because it was almost a thing of like like when the way that the media were like in interviewing there, it's almost like they were a bit too credulous with the claims of the company. Like the company is like you know talking about how the company itself was talking about how effective, the, you know they were. You know obviously we, you know people paid us money and we and we did a damn good job at it. You know just you know without without necessarily having the better perspective as to like how effective their work could have been. Let me take a, I just need to take a quick break. I will be right back. Okay. Smoke the movie out. Yep. Yeah. Hey, I'm still, hey. I'm still here. All right. So Bannon, evil Bannon person. Bannon, Bannon, Bannon. Oh yeah. Well, no, Jer Jeremy just stepped out. So I'm, I'm, yeah, it's just me. So we can just talk about how Bannoning the Bannon Bannon is. Uh, well, he's very, he's, I would describe him as Bannon-esque. He's Bannon-tastic. Yeah. Well, um, although, you know, I, I I have to be a little bit careful about how I phrase this, but I have always tried to take a certain detached, quasi-sociopathic look at some of these people and just sort of examine tactics and strategy. And I have to say, I do have a, a certain respect for the guy. I mean, when you talk about creating the media, it's hard to think of people who have done that as well as Bannon. Well, Bannon's fascinating for me because he's get basically the anti Carl Rove, but he's effectively done the same thing Carl Rove did for the Bushes. Mm -hmm. um, but it it's also interesting how how that took for Trump, but not for anybody else so far. Um, so like no one else has been able to run on like this this. Uh, you know, I was hearing people talk about like Roy Moore as a Trumpist candidate, and I'm like Roy Moore is an old you know, religious crank. It's not really the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, I, you know, I'll be honest with you though. The left should be thankful that, that, uh, that Trump is as gauche and as fucking incompetent as he is. Because if we had a competent, uh, soft nationalist right now, we would be in deep shit. So you're not a big but, fan of the idea of president Pence. <laughs> Uh, no, not particularly. And it's this weird sort of thing. I, yeah, my friends and um, my friends have pointed out that it has been odd that you've seen a lot of leftists like we must get the neoconservatives back. I'm like, what, 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 what bizarro land world am I in? Save us, Newt Gingrich. Yeah, for real. Um, the clarity that Tom that Tom Delay brought to uh, American politics. <laughs> we need the hammer back. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's funny to me because I think one of the interesting things is um, the Democrats are probably going to give Trump his only real wins. So we'll have that. You mean continue to or? Yeah, continue to give him his only real wins because the Republicans are the people who keep on fucking him up. Like, because, you know, the, the, his ideology is so opposed to theirs, really, at the end of the day. So like they can't agree. They're not to the extent that he has one. Yeah, tax reform done. They can't. They could. They can't fix DACA without with the Democrats. Um, they they can't. Re they're not agreed enough to do anything about health care, except maybe pull out you know um, birth control, which is not saying it doesn't matter. It does, but I mean it's uh, compared to what they wanted to do. So tiny. Um, you know. So it that's fascinating to me that. And leftists haven't really realized that in a lot of ways. I mean, um, <clears throat> oh, sorry. I just, I just, I just thought of, I just thought of something really quick. Um, where do you personally? What do you usually use as a rule of thumb between because of to separate, say, liberal from leftist? Because I think part of it um, is, I think for for everybody's a liberal, but me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, I actually, you know, I, I have said this because I consider myself the most anti-liberal leftist there is, which is a weird thing because I sometimes defend liberal, like liberal ideas like free speech. But um, um, I have said jokingly that everyone's a liberal, but I and me and I'm not so sure about me. Um, Variation yeah, I, of the classic, the, yeah. The dialectical tension, and I, I'm using Marxist buzzwords, forgive me, but the dialectical tension between leftism and liberalism is going to be with us for a while. Because leftism comes out of a reaction against the failures of liberalism from moment one. I mean, you know, um, Engels was a liberal before he became a Marxist, or right. whatever the hell he was. 
Um, Marx was a quasi liberal. Um, you know, but what bores out leftism is frustration with the fact that li liberalism never finishes any damn thing, and it never has. Um, the, the list of unfinished revolutions is, you know, all of them. So, um, and uh, I mean, you know, you say what you will about the left, we've we've massively messed up in the ways that have killed millions of people. Um, so you know, we we got our own shit to deal with, but. I'm not. One, I don't want to be like soft on that. Like I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, Stalin wasn't leftist. No, yeah, he was. He's just not one we want to be. Um, but um, so what distinguishes left from liberal for me is how you feel about capitalism, how you feel about the Democratic Party, and those are actually kind of separate questions. Even there, mm. um, I consider Keynesians liberals. Sorry, um, and that thus discludes a lot of people who think they're socialist. I think I would like. My definition actually kicks out about half the DSA from the DSA. Um, but, you know, they're just progressives according to their mission statement. So that can be about anything. Uh, can you expand on that a little? I mean, when, when well, you talk, I mean, what, what, I mean, what, what political, what, what, what economic ideas what? specifically? Sorry, go ahead. Huh? Uh, what economic ideas uh, specifically are you taking issue with with these people? Keynesianism, which is the idea that if you just redistribute... Uh, tax revenues that you would have something like socialism. I just think that's false. New Deal. Uh, gotcha. The yeah. New Deal. The New Deal is not our friend. I mean, in some ways, I, I don't. I would not oppose a Democrat who was running on those sorts of legislations or a Democratic socialist like Bernie Sanders um, for, for running on those legislations, but not because I thought it was even a goal, but because I think like we need – you need economic moving space that, that would give us. But at the same time, what I've learned historically that is, is if you put that as your platform, you're never going to get anything more than that. You're barely going to get that. Mm -hmm. mm. So, you know, like, like to me, working with Keynesians and working with uh, modern monetary theorists and all these kind of quasi capitalist, quasi socialist hybrid people is um, something that you have to do. But it's also something that's kind of inherently corrupting and and because you end up defending their policies, not yours. So you end up defending like we we've spent the last the 20th century instead of pushing for socialist policies, like defending the New Deal and poorly. I, I'm detecting um, a certain lack of enthusiasm for the new slogan, a better deal. Oh, God. And if I hear Medicare for all one more time, I was going to. Um. I mean, like, my God, what kind of lack of branding and vision is that? And the fact that the DSA, like, was like, we're fighting for Medicare for all. Like, we can't even brand it better than the Democrats. We can think of shit. Like, we're half of us are fucking artists anyway. Like, it's Medicare it's, for all. My God, people don't die for that. <laughs> it's not exactly rise like lions. No, it's not even hope and change. <laughs> <laughs> It's not even Obama level branding. Come on. Um <laughs> The you know, um, and, Oh god. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm 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 done with my rant. I was getting angry. <laughs> No, I think because like one of the things that I noticed was uh, I had a couple well, you know, like folks I I know both you know, both in real life and even like on Facebook kind of like really um you know, it's it's like I said the the election kind of threw them for a loop, but it was a thing where they whereas some people get, uh, get, got more radical in tone and, and I guess and content, but it was a thing where they um, like a lot of folks are just uh, like I had friends who kind of almost like balked at that. Like they just they just as they said, it, they, you know, they just see a bunch of people, um, you know, who just want to burn everything down. And, and you we know, don't and I guess in the, with the inherent criticism that that would be a bad thing. It's almost like a lot of people like believing, you know, believing in horseshoe theory. Mm -hmm. For whatever I mean, well, I guess for the reason because you know it expanded there, but I just thought it was that was just one of the things of like in fact even that wanted to ha thought about even having like a uh, like a recording an episode just talking about that about how you know what you know what even I personally it's kind of like it's tried to like suss out the difference between the two little like strands because it's I think part of it is it was mentioned before it's like we've just gone, come off of forty odd years of anything that we you know we're 
anything um, where that was not branded, not branded Republican or conservative was just referred to, you know, interchangeably as, you know, take your pick left, leftist, a liberal, progressive, you know, most radical socialist uh, pr- uh, policy in, in, you know, in American history, that kind of a thing. Whereas now, um, once the uh, once the break is when, when, once there was a little, you know, a little bit of a break or discontinuity now, um, the different kind of like more left leaning what tendencies are now kind of breaking apart and kind of trying to self-define. Yeah, I think w- what we have right now is a moment of really profound confusion, and, and you see it on the right, too. The right's actually better able to handle it because they've been having this profound confusion for longer. Um, and it, it's all throughout the aughts. People didn't really notice, but, I mean, the battle between the neocons, the resurgence of a kind of paleoconservatism, the, um, the decline of churches as a, as a real pulling force in American cultural life. This is not to say they don't exist, but they exist only at the margins now. Um, really changed a lot of the discourse in the conservative movement, and nobody really thought about it. Because at first it led to massive defeat in 2006 and 2008, and then you had the Tea Party resurgence, but the Tea Party really wasn't that different than what came before it. Right. It was more radical kind of sounding, but not really. Um, I mean, if you compared it to even like the contract for America in the 90s, it wasn't that much more to the right of that. Um, it's yeah. just people were shocked because they had assumed that like we had this permanent liberal victory after the bad Bush years and everybody would never believe that there could be a president worse than George Bush. He was the worst president ever. Be careful what you wish for, people. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's a lot of it. And and right now, also, I think people forget that Occupy came out of the fact that, that Obama really fundamentally failed to change the Democratic Party in any real meaningful way. It, um, I mean, literally. I mean, like, the moment he stepped out of the center line, like, what did you have? You had the same people you saw in the 90s, and the same people who were running the party are the people who ran it in the 90s. Um, you know, the sort of um, end of Clinton period, uh, Biden, and... It's just faces that you're already familiar with and that are all in their 70s. I mean, in, 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 in some ways, I don't mean to sound ageist or whatever, but like even Bernie Sanders is ancient. Mm-hmm. Um, his political history and his rise, to, his rise to where he is now begins in the 80s, you know. Mm. And, and he didn't come out of nowhere. That's, yeah. a, that's actually completely n- not really the case. It was the fact that, that we live in a moment where there is such disgust at, this, at the center – that um uh that became clear but what we have now is like even in a dsa the the dsa i, I was talking to a, a left member of the dsa the other day on one of my podcasts and you know i'm a big fan i well i would say i'm a big fan of the dsa if i'm honest but i'm a fan of the, what the the current move left within the dsa as it currently exists however um it can't clarify what it is either and it's any attempt to do so is going to going to split off so many different groups that its coalition that it's just built is going to become too fragile. You know, and we we are talking about a coalition that's really the size of only a small city, but since it's the largest thing the left has seen since the 70s, um, that people don't want to rock that boat too much in certain key ways. Um, I mean, like, imagine if you actually defined what democratic socialism is. Because... Pass. The, if you... Yeah, no one wants to do it. And um, the DSA doesn't want to do it either. It doesn't want a platform. It doesn't want to call itself a party. So, you know, it's not a party. So what is it exactly? It's also not a union or a para-union organization. It's an activist org. But it's an activist org without a very, without a, a, a clear established goal. And, again, these sounds like really hard critiques. I think the DSA right now is the best we got. Which, in a way, to me, actually points out how how hard this is going to be with all these new baby leftists. Because, I mean, like, they're about to have a – we're going to have to fight over our identity, particularly if the Democrats reestablish themselves. Because we are benefiting right now. We can all be anti thought together. You know, like, everybody hates fascists, whatever. We're united against this. Even some Republicans, probably. You know? Once that clarity goes away, we're going to be scrambling. And you see that – you saw that at the end of the Bush years too. Um, I think it's going to be much worse this time. I don't know. We'll have to see. But Good on that yeah, I'm always using the Jeremiah prophet of doom about lefty topics. So. 
anything you've been partaking of uh, lately that you'd want to, uh, uh, to uh, turn anybody on to? What would you say? The, the okay. Do you have a reading recommendation mm-hmm. for a baby leftist? Yeah, let's let's go for that. Oh my god. Um. You know, I would tell people to read Revolutions in the Air, uh, which is about the 70s and uh, Days of Rage, and mm-hmm. learn about how the left really screwed up in the 70s. That's really important. Um, I would say read... Uh, I would say um, read maybe um, right-wing critics of American conservatism to actually get how this happened on the right and how long it's been going on and how everybody just kind of let it slip under the radar. I would read... Uh, the critique of the Goethe program by Karl Marx about how, you know, most most things don't actually deliver what they say. It's a good exercise in kind of lefty logic. I would read, um, you know, um, I would actually stay away from theory for a while. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big theory head myself, but I would say read some history about yeah. uh, the first and second international um, and then uh, – the you know there's a really good book about the rise and decline of the SPA the Socialist Party of America that I would tell everybody to read because I think we could see something like that with the DSA without meaning to and it would be such a case of the history repeating itself because the DSA actually exists because of the disintegration of the SPA yeah like so the SPA disintegrated into two movements one was a one was an explicit party the SPUSA and the other was the DSA. Um, which wanted to make wanted to pull the Democrats lefter and thought that it you know that the SPA could focus kind of as a caucus within the Democrats. I mean that's what Harrington socialism really was, and um, and that understanding that trajectory because that party like the SPA was one of the first socialist parties. It's not as old as the SP, as the SPA day, you know in Germany, but it's actually really old. I mean it's older than the Bolsheviks. Um, and had all kinds of crazy – I mean there's racist stuff in it, all kinds of crazy stuff in that party. Um, but people should know it, and, and like I don't think people know their history of American socialism at all. Like right, yeah. most baby leftists don't know that there's a hundred-year history of us screwing up. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, – um, Go ahead. I was going to say, no, my uh, – I the mayor of my hometown – uh, from 1910 to 1912 until Charles until uh Charles Stuart Mott and uh the and other uh, the other early GM um uh financiers helped defeat him was you know like one of the few one of few like socialist mayors in American history but, yeah but, i mean there's there's been a couple and there are like there are socialists like boroughs that that kind of held on um I'm very progressive boroughs but i do you know, like i do I actually also want to talk about like i like bernie as much as the next guy in a lot of ways i don't want to well i i i'm pretty critical of bernie actually but well, I, mean, all, I, I, all, I do understand why he's important all men hmm? like bernie that's that's known well all, yeah. men, all men on the internet yeah <laughs> yeah everybody likes bernie uh, I, i've been called a brochureless a lot until recently i don't know I've been called everything, though. So the other thing as a baby leftist, you will be denounced by your own side for stupid reasons all the time. Just just shrug it off. Don't get upset. It's going to, like, don't let it get to you. Um, and and learn about your history. Those are the two things. So read that book on the DSA. Let me look. Actually, I'll tell you who. You'll see. Yeah, what's the um, name of that on the book on the history of the SPA? The SPA, excuse me. So of america the best book on the topic is um the socialist part of america complete history by jack ross jack and it ross. does go into the formation of the dsa and the s and the spusa too although it, just the formation it stops really there um it goes into the shackmanites the trotskyists who entered the party um and you know uh the two different wings about how to work with the democrats i mean like there's there's so much you can learn from that book and it covers basically 120 years it's 800 and it's 800 something pages i mean it's, Jesus. It's, it's a good it's a good read and it's a chunk of your life but wow. um it's a good thing to know um and uh if you want a shorter book maybe i maybe read radicals in america by um howard brick um just to get like the the capsule version at a mere 360 something pages <laughs> yeah the, but, the one, yeah one thing i have noticed even was in a um <laughs> 
over the weekend was went to the working went to the uh, the working because I'm a member of the local DSA here. Shockingly, um, went to a, a, oh. a meeting of the of like the, the one of the working groups is trying to put together kind of like a rough, pretty much just you know a rough intro course study course for folks, and you know talking about pointing out like you know learn you know if we. <laughs> history is hard as hell to learn, but it's a one using, uh, I should say theory is hard as hell to learn, but when going, going at it through, uh, through history, it actually makes it, you know, it goes down a lot smoother because you actually have like, you know, characters and narrative and, um, oh, yeah. and you know, real people in real places in the dish yet. And you can see the consequences of stuff. And some of the things that we're going through right now have happened before. Right. Like that's the other thing. Like, like it's not like every generation totally invents this shit out of nothing. Right. What's the um, um, what's the what's the line from Battlestar? What is it like all all of this has happened before and will happen again or whatever the hell was. Sorry. Yeah. Very Watch way very, ba- very Battlestar Galactic, and we're gonna wake up and realize we're in the past of the future of the past. Yeah. <laughs> also, they're gonna claim yeah. that there's a plan when there actually isn't one. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, but that's always the case, right? I mean, like hell, even like um, Lenin's great, great revolutionary uh, major treaty was basically. Russia's gonna blow this war up. Let's actually like wait and see what happens and try to play both sides off of each other to go back to Russia and take power. Which was uh which was like the ultimate Hail Mary gambit. I mean, you know, so and we can talk about like what Leninism is as a as a co coincised doctrine and you can actually learn what actually happened and you're like, What well, holy shit, the number of contingencies that made that possible is not even funny. Which, um, yeah, that's, which is, I mean, talk about history as well. Like, yeah, whenever the the standard like online remark was like, well, point out where, you know, it's like social immorality always leads to, you know, X and Y and Z, all negative outcomes that were all like hilariously historically contingent. But anyway. Yeah, like, like, and they tend to bluff one another. And I mean, it's. It's one of these things where, like, socialism always, like, in what country? I mean, like, there are still socialist countries that, you know, you would actually like to go to. And and, and there are also not socialist countries that everyone thinks are socialists that are probably still kind of okay comparatively to the United States, but um, have a lot of problems. I mean, it's funny, the weird uh, schizophrenia, like, we have on the Nordic model. That's another big one. Um, but I don't really want to go there. Most of the good books about that aren't in English. Gotcha. So oh, there you go. Is there is, right. it, is there something you would uh, not recommend? Something you would suggest? Baby left us avoid. Yeah. Re- yeah. What 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 should we run far away from? Well, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question. If somebody in the DSA hands me something and says, "Read this," Badu. Uh, if they give Badu, uh, just, no. Um, no. I mean. I I, t- I tend to think that uh, oh man, you know what you should really avoid. You should avoid um, um oh. I would tell people to be really skeptical when reading um. Hagiographic Hagri- stuff about leftism of the past, um, and also maybe um some of the popular magazines right now i would say read them but read them very critically like like don't trust everything jackman tells you and not even because jackman has a necessarily bad line or they're bad people or some or uh Sankura is like a bad guy i actually like him kind of i've never met him personally but i've had many exchanges with him that weren't were civil and he says some things i think aren't stupid um but um, the, it's easy to get into uh, a kind of like everything in the kitchen sink socialism, and I actually don't know that that helps anybody. Um, and, I, and I know people get tired of reading books, and I'm actually sympathetic to that. Um, but I would say take history over theory, um, and even demography and stuff over theory, and um, maybe if someone tells you to read something that like, uh, we're gonna use this model from 1917 or from uh, from World War II to revamp the left in America. Run, like because even though I, like I'm not a person who gets on my moral high horse about Lenin or have even like you know um, I'm not an anti-Leninist. I'm not a libertarian socialist in in that hard sense where like anything Bolshevik makes me cringe. But if someone tells you they're gonna take that and apply it to the conditions of the United States, they are full of shit. 
because it's fundamentally different. Like we're not on the excerpts of an empire that was failing at the time where there's a major world war where we could cynically take advantage of the dis disintegration of that world. Like they, we, there's just not none of the historical conditions are the same. Um, and so run, run away, run away, far away. Now I, I know a lot of these people are still normy enough that they're not going to be handed linen yet, mm -hmm. but it'll happen, you know? And, and, and again, um, particularly since it's 1970, the 100th anniversary, it's 2017, it's going to happen a lot. Um, I, and I say, like, engage with Lennon, learn from Lennon, read good books about him. Um, there are some good books, both critical and not, and, and um, actually some good books that make him seem better than a lot of people think and more democratically minded than a lot of people realize, at least in the – at least before 1921. Um, but – I would say run away from anyone who thinks they can take that model and just apply it um, or any model. You get anyone who tells you they have a model that's going to cause the left to win and go, OK, well, if this model worked, why are we in the situation we are right now? All right. So the answer, if it's anything that's historically based or based off or even based off experience and they say they know the answer to how we're going to make the left win, whatever the next election, the, you know, the revolution or whatever r run away. Cause it's going to be horse poop. Like, and even, even fairly good stuff. Like I've read some good stuff that but it, you'll hit a point though, where, where you're just like, well, what labor movement are we building off of? Or, you know, how are we going to transfer this into this? Or, how is revolutionary defeatism going to apply to the United States where we have a nuclear bomb? You know, like, um, just run away from that stuff. You, um, you're better trying to, like, you're better trying to figure out what we mean by socialism and then how to do that um, or what we mean by progressivism, even if you're not a socialist, and how to actually do that and clarifying your thought on that than trying to come up with a pre-prescriptive plan on how to take everything over because that's just not going to happen. We don't live in that world. All right, that seems like um, that seems like as good as anything else to uh, to end it. We got a bunch of recommendations, talked a lot, covered a lot of ground. Um, Jacob, you got anything? Any last words? Who's this Marx guy you keep talking about? Yeah, uh, it, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> Groucho Marx. Yeah, I was gonna say I was say Zeppo Marx, the one yeah. who was only he was a member of the stage of the vaudeville stage crew. I don't think he ever actually appeared in any of the films. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I think maybe he was he had no, wait, a no, union was, card perhaps. No, wait, no, that was no, that was Gummo. No, Zeppo. Was, wait, I think no, Zeppo was in the films. I think it was Gummo. Gummo was the one. That, eh, whatever. Yeah, but, one of the O's. Yeah, um, last forgotten members of socialism that they are. Wrapping us up. Thanks, Derek, for uh, for spending some time on you know, opining with us over the uh, over the scratchy internets on to uh, this thing I make, as it were. Yeah, it was, awesome sauce. We appreciate I look it. Forward to listening to your podcast. Usually, your podcasts have a lot more fun stuff than me ranting. So that um, I hope your listeners aren't too disappointed. Yeah, well, please don't take it too personally when I issue a blistering takedown of you and Jacobin soon. It's fine if if you can make your career making a blistering takedown of me, I would give it to you actually, like because it would actually spread the gospel of Barnism. Um, Shit, so, you know. I forgot about the denunciations. Yep. I gotta totally. practice. Totally. Forgot the second rule. Yeah. Oh. Damn it. <laughs> if any, uh, uh, Derek, if anybody wants to get a hold of you online, what's the best way for folks to uh, track you down through pod or email or whatever contact way? Uh, it, it, email, you can contact symptomaticredness uh, at gmail.com. That's my uh, podcasty email um you could find systematic commentary on on uh, facebook that's my public um facebook page it covers more than just lefty stuff it also covers poetry and whatnot but mm -hmm. um you can contact me through that you can find my personal facebook page which is which takes up too much of my life and i uh secretly resent um because i've been totally sucked it's like sucked um so uh we can um you can find me there and while i probably won't friend you if you message me i will probably reply back cool when is your uh when's your book coming out um next june next june yeah. okay cool well, we got a little while and then uh 
Um, oh yeah, and if you want to listen to more of me, you can always go over to Zero Books, um, and I'll be on something there uh, sometime. The Zero Squared podcast also emanating out of Portland, Oregon, about a hand, only about three or four miles south of uh, south of uh, where we are. Oh yeah, you, you're you're close to Ground Zero for um, Zero Squared, huh? Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll end you on this thought. Um, I was talking to my students today, and they were asking me what the least diverse major city was in the United States, and I looked it up. Portland, Oregon. It's Portland, Oregon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the second least diverse is Salt Lake, which is what the kids thought, were thought was thinking was going to be my answer. But no, they didn't get that um, uh, consolation prize. They were they were second. <laughs> so, yeah. There you go. Apropos of nothing. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that is it for tonight. Um, thanks, you ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in. Let's see. Jay, um, well, anyway, thanks, Varn. Well, thanks, Derek. Well, um, I enjoy your podcast. It needs to be more famous than it is. We agree on that. It's actually pretty – I actually like it better than Chapo, but that's not saying much because I don't like Chapo as much as everybody else seems to. Um, maybe I'm just contrary by nature, and the moment they started making money, I secretly resented them. But um, – That'll happen. Well, Me I and everybody we, we've else. We've got to beat on that score. Yeah. Like, yeah. who on the left has a fucking functional business model? What the hell is that? <laughs> um... <laughs> Couldn't tell you. <laughs> Automatically lose their little lefty cred by succeeding. <laughs> yeah. How dare? Yeah. How dare they? Uh, how how dare they keep it in the black? Yeah. Th- there does yeah. seem to be a principled resistance on the left to picking up the master's tools. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um. Weird. The master schools being Patreon. <laughs> hey, capitalism. War, if the parts of capitalism can be used against capitalism. I mean, well, this. Well, I mean, well, this is just straight donating. But yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's more. It's more like the tools of the dude. When the, the uh, yeah, the, the tools of the dude from what was it? What Pomplemousse? What the hell is that name? Yeah. The name of that band? Yeah. Oh well. Yeah, it, it, you know what's funny though? It's one of those things where like, hey, actually, we're good at disrupting something, and it's weird. Um. You know, you're probably not recording, but this is hilarious. And maybe you should do a, a podcast on this one day. Oh, I never Why turned the recorders off. Podcasting tended to be left wing, and YouTube and YouTube stuff tends to be right wing. Like, what's with that? I actually have no idea why that is the case, but it is definitely the case. Like, uh, people, uh, I think it's it's an uh, you you see a successful idea of it, and like you uh, like you find out about it, and then you um, it's like, hey. It is it's it's like it's yeah. it's when you first get into punk, you see punk a bunch of quid punk bands, and you want to you want to form your own band. So it's like that kind of a thing. How about that? Yeah, it's a very similar thing. All right, guys, well, I'm going to let you go. It was fun, though. All right. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Bye. Well, that was fun. Crushed it. Yeah. Any, uh, anything you particularly want to recommend? Uh, I'd like to recommend the new Blade Runner movie. I haven't actually seen it yet, but I want to appear cultured. That is uh, that is one way to do it. I have seen it. I also recommend it. It is um, it is it's a, it's a good watch, and it's a good you get a lot of it's you get a lot of value for your dollar because it's a good t- two and a half hours or more. So there's that. Yeah. Oh, also, um, I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, so, Jacob, if anybody has wants to get a hold of you, or do you have anything else to promote? I am still taking care of things at uh, the Barkles Incorporated Company. Mm-hmm. We've got the website barkles.dog going, and you can also check out Barkles the dog himself tweeting at the real Barkles. And I am really impressed that a dog can tweet like that, and I would strongly recommend it. All right. It is. Yep. Yeah, check out the real Barkles and Barkles dot dog. Uh, as for me, uh, thanks for li- listening once again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, contact the show. Whatever. Find us on Facebook. Subscribe, like, subscribe, and share. And you can even probably, you know, if you want to like share us with others. We're even on some of our shows. are even on. Um, some of the podcasts I've even uploaded to YouTube because why not? Uh, it's it's we're at uh, facebook.com slash giving the mic or giving the mic at Twitter, blah blah blah. Uh, thanks to the mysterious breakfast breakfast serialer for our theme. Um, I've been your host Jeremy. Uh, Jacob has been my guest. Uh, Derek Varn, um, re- current re- uh, inhabitant of Salt Lake City, has been our special guest. And that's it. Good night. Peace out. Yep. 
Ah, that was pretty good. Yeah. Longer than I expected, but... Yeah. Sorry, I'm so good at asking questions. Derek, can you say something real quick? Hello. There you go. All right, that's better. Helps if I uh, helps if I adjust the um, the the, uh, the audio out of the computer. All right. Um, well, I guess. How many? <laughs> this is so. This way, this is part of your Operation Varnio, is it not? To expand your uh, your podcast reach. Sure. <laughs> that started as kind of as a joke, but yes. I mean, I, I am probably the most regular guest on Left Wing Podcasting. Doesn't who doesn't have a book out? Gotcha. I mean, so um, I do have a book coming out, but it has nothing to do with left wing politics at all. So wow, really? They allow that? What is uh, poetry? Is, I was to say, was that one of your poetry books, or oh, okay? Yeah, it's a poetry book. Yeah. Um, as for you know the the rest of the stuff I do. Um, I don't really know how I ended up. Well, I mean, I know how I got into podcasting on the left. It's because I was invited to speak on Derrida back when I was a um, professor. Well, um, a lecturer, technically, mm. um, a member of the professorial faculty at a university in Korea to partly examine life. And it all went downhill from there. Um, that uh -huh. was about five and a half years ago. Partly examined life. Oh yeah, that's what. Because yeah, because partly examined life has been going on that long, hasn't it? Yeah, um, I was an I was one of their first guests actually, and um, uh, then I um, Douglas Lane heard me, and well, actually, I think KMO heard me from uh, KMO's uh, Seed Realm cast, and then Douglas Lane heard me and invited me on and mostly from fighting with him actually and uh the rest is history i suppose that's a pretty good way to establish a professional relationship yeah yeah um calling someone stupid online yeah it, it, it's remarkably effective for me actually you've been surprised um i think most of the left must have stockholm syndrome that's true uh what where i figured um I figured just if nothing else, and because uh, my my two usual co-hosts, which Jacob here has uh, like uh, guested on my other sh my the regular show a couple times, I think you've even heard an episode or two. Um, so uh, casting out, I asked Jacob if he's come join me because uh, one on one conversation I am not as good at. Yeah. So now we've got an actual adult in the room. All right. Yeah. Now it. Derek, it's very important that we know what did you think of the Rick and Morty season three finale? <laughs> I don't watch television. Good answer. <laughs> not even it's not even the stuff that's streamed through YouTube. <laughs> uh, apparently, I well lately I've been watching that, but it, it's 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 very strange to be honest with you, being back in um uh, America because a I have to legally pay for stuff um, as opposed to pirating at all and b i have to care which you know when you when you're living in egypt no one gives a shit if you know anything about american culture i guess so I so you know i know someone got stabbed over szechuan sauce and i know i'm the exact age that to have been a high schooler when that came out the first time and i didn't remember it then and don't really understand the obsession now so yeah The, uh, the, uh, the the fandom in the internet ruins all. Why is my why is my headphone buzzing? Oh, that's why because the cable's breaking. Great, perfect, lovely. All right, um, but uh, so I figured, how much time do you guys just want to like, yak for an hour or something, or just see how it yeah, goes? Yeah, let's, or... let's 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 aim for an hour. Okay, sounds good. Let's aim for an hour. The hell not. Yeah. You good for an hour, Jacob? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. Damn it! I'm sorry, I'm freaking out about noise on the headphones because once in a while, 
There we go. Once in a while, uh, this thing will this thing will get too close to a power cord and start feeding uh, feeding static back into it, back into um, into the recording. And um, as a uh, you know, as I say, as a <laughs> you know, the rare thing for a hobbyist podcaster is actually, I guess, you know, caring a you know obsessing a bit too much over uh, audio quality. Which I guess is not a uh, not a universal uh, not a universal consideration, given the rest of uh, everybody out there. But what do I know? <laughs> 